I got fuzz. All right, I think we're good. How's it going, everybody? So, couple of announcements. I see that quite a few of you have um, already handed in your writing assignments. If you need more time on your writing assignment, the deadline is um, tonight at 11.55. Can I see your health assessment, please? I knew it was something else, but keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there is a writing assignment that is due tonight. Quite a few of you have already turned it in. If you need more time, please shoot me an email. If you have any questions about what you are reading, please shoot me an email and I'm happy to help you out. Um, I know that working through these articles can be kind of difficult sometimes. So hopefully the blog post helped, but do know I can help you out too if I need if if you need that. And also, do notice that I I'm, I'm probably not going to put too much weight on the summaries so much. If you have a basic idea of what the article covered, I'm not going to be too harsh on it. But you do actually have to look like you've read it. <laughs> so as long as you do that, you'll be good. Um, another quick announcement that I uh, did want to make is that I am currently in the process of writing your second exam. That will post this Wednesday and it will be due the following Wednesday. Um, as you know, it is open book, open note, and uh, you only get one shot to take it, but I am giving you a little bit of extra time. And this time, unlike last time, I will give you enough space on your short answer questions so you're not just writing a sentence of me being Okay, I understood it, 10 points. So do be aware that that is uh, what's going on. Additionally, our fifth quiz posted yesterday, it will be due on Sunday evening at 11.59. So make sure that you get that in. All right. Are we having a review session? We're always gonna have a review session. And if, is that Geneva? Geneva, is that you? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're, we're always, I thought so, but it didn't show up. We are always going to have a review session, and I will also have a study guide out for you as well. So I'll post both of those on Wednesday. So it's going to cover attention, short-term and working memory, uh, learning, or today, learning, which we are covering today, forgetting, and if we have time, semantic memory. If we don't, I'll move it to the third exam. So it hopefully shouldn't cover too many chapters. All right, so with that in mind, today we are gonna talk about how you actually get all of that information from short-term memory into long-term memory. So I think you're gonna like today's lecture. So one of the things that I think that this lecture more than anything else will impress upon you is that you actually have to study things if you wanna remember them for later. You cannot just put a textbook under your pillow and hope that all of that information will magically enter your mind. Uh, you cannot learn by osmosis. Or as my sister, who is also very pedantic, just like me, likes to say, it's diffusion. Osmosis only happens with a liquid. I'm like, thank you, Captain Obvious, but it's more fun to say learning by osmosis. Um, but unfortunately, you can't do that. This is the lecture where you get all of the best ways to study for your tests, and they're actually backed up by research. So if I've ever told you you need to study for something and you go, show me the evidence that says that this works. Oh, I have it. I have it in spades. So today we're gonna to talk about how all of that information gets from short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, so I should have sent you an email. I believe I sent it last night. I filmed a video on working memory capacity that was a little less than 20 minutes. So it's pretty quick. I also sent you to a link to some demonstrations that you can do including operation span. 
I am going to resend that link later because I'm going to talk later this uh, later in the week about an extra credit opportunity using those demonstrations. So hold on to that email if you haven't deleted it already. So now that we have information in short-term memory, how do we get it into long-term memory? And again, studying and learning is key. You actually have to pay attention to something to be able to learn it. So right now, uh, here in class, and those of you that are on Zoom, um, raise your hand or type in the chat or on the Discord if you're really bad with names. Like if you're really bad with remembering people's names. Okay, so we've got two here in class. Let's see if anybody is bad with names in the chat. Leah, you're good with names? Nice. Okay, anybody else? So here's one of the things that I like to tell people. When it comes to remembering names, part of the reason that you're so bad at remembering people's names is that nine times out of 10, you aren't paying enough attention to that name to begin with. Oftentimes when you meet somebody for the first time, you are more focused with what you are going to say next. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say, I don't do that too, because I do. I love hearing the sound of my own voice in case you haven't noticed. Um, but when you spend all of that time focusing on what you want to say, you are not actually focusing attention on trying to remember somebody's name. So one of the tricks that they'll tell you is to repeat that person's name and often. Now that can sound really creepy if you do that wrong. So if I met Robin, for example, for the first time, I'm like, Robin, that's, that's a really nice name. It's nice to meet you, Robin. But what do you think about that, Robin? It's, it's kind of creepy when you repeat somebody's name too many times in rapid fire succession. So don't do that. Don't be a creeper. But um, what you can do is occasionally say that person's name, give yourself a few minutes before you say it again. You're repeating the person's name and you're testing yourself. Both of those things can boost your memory and help you remember people's names and thus you will appear less socially awkward. So studying is key. So let's talk about learning. Now, I am not talking about the type of learning that you may have learned about in uh, general psychology where we talk about learning and conditioning. I am talking about the cognitive type of learning. If you wanna learn more about learning and conditioning, I'm teaching a class in it next spring. We are gonna work with a computerized rat and a computerized Skinner box. Because if I had to do that with a real one, I'd cry. <laughs> So one of the first major findings in memory research is something called the total time hypothesis. And this generally says the more time that you spend studying something, the better your memory for that is going to be. So somebody who only studies uh, the material for an hour is probably not going to have as good performance as somebody who studies for two hours or three hours. So the more that you study something, the better your memory performance is. And the evidence that we have for this is based on the work of a researcher named Herman Ebbinghaus. So Herman Ebbinghaus is really interesting because he is, he did a lot of really interesting work in memory. A lot of what we know about memory, we can credit to him. However, what you may not know is that he actually used himself as his experimental subject. So, and it amazes me how anybody would have enough time in their day to do something like this. So what he ended up doing, and I'm going to go ahead and stop screen share for a second so you can see what's on the board behind me. Um, what he actually did was presented um, himself with these really, really long lists of what we call CVCs. We call them CVCs because they're made up of a consonant, a vowel, 
and another consonant. So you basically have these long lists of nonsense syllables. And so um, Ebbinghaus would basically look at long lists of things like this, and he would study a list a certain number of times and see how long it took him to relearn that list absolutely perfectly. So let's go ahead and see. So he remembered these long lists of nonsense words. He varied how many times he had to study them. And in one case, he would study a list up to 64 times in one day. Ew. <laughs> so he varied how many times he, these uh, lists were studied. And then he was interested in a process known as relearning. So how long would it take him or how many repetitions would it take him to learn that list absolutely perfectly? Does anybody need some more time here? Okay, so here's what Ebbinghaus finds. Now, I realize this graph is a little odd. If, if we were showing this in research methods, I would tell you it's a really bad graph because uh, the lower number is at the top of the axis and the higher number is at the bottom, but it actually kind of helps here. So here we have how many times he repeated a list on day one. So here he could repeat it as few as eight, 16, 24, 32, 42, 53, up to 64 times. Here is time in minutes to relearn items on day two. For, uh, for a list that was repeated 64 times, it took a little bit more than five minutes. For something that was only repeated eight times, it took about 20 minutes for Ebbinghaus to relearn it. So this shows that the more time that you spend on something, the less time it will take you to relearn it. And that's because your memory for it is better. So this provides support for our total time hypothesis. If you want to learn something, you have to study it. If you want to learn something really well, you have to study it more. And the more that you study something, the better your memory is going to be. So the total time hypothesis actually underlies a lot of our learning. Uh, for example, um, I don't really play guitar very well, and that's because I spent a lot of time learning it over spring break and during the early parts of the pandemic, and now I do it less. Guess how my guitar playing sounds? Not very good. I should probably fix that. So generally, anytime that you want to learn something, you have to study it. If you want to be better, you have to study more. But we can actually modify the effect of the total time hypothesis by looking at a lot of different factors. So this is a really useful lecture. So I'm glad I'm live streaming this and sharing it with you. This lecture in particular is going to come in handy when we talk about um, our project. So you're making an advertisement for a project. Um, as part of this project. Some of the things that you learn here can help your customer remember information about your product. So this lecture could be very useful for you. You know, and also applicable to real life, of course. So one of the first things that we need to talk about is what is called distribution of practice. So uh, those of you that are Zooming in and those of you that are in class, raise your hand if you have ever crammed for an exam. No, no judgment. Emma, you never have? No, because it stresses me out too much. Cramming so. stresses you out? Yeah, so I study early. That's, that's, that's amazing. Even I, like, I didn't really have much of the social life, so my grades were good. But I, I will tell you, I pulled the occasional all-nighter. I studied for the GRE psychology exam by reading a Gen Psych textbook the night before. It was the subject exam. I studied for the real GRE. <laughs> Most people cram. But I have a feeling, and I actually just talked about this with a bunch of first-year students uh, as part of the SOAR program last week. 
That's a pretty good, you've had this experience. I know I've had it. I'm sure you have had it. I want you to imagine that you've just crammed for a test. You go in and take the test and it goes pretty well. And then as soon as you walk out the door, all of that information just flies right out of your head. Yeah, that's what happens when you cram. <laughs> All right, so I'm calling it cramming, but if you want to use a technical term, the technical term is masked practice. Masked practice is when you do all of your studying all at once. So those of you that like to study the night before a test and it's maybe the first time in a long time that you cracked open a book or cracked open your notes, that's masked practice. You're not taking any breaks. You're just doing several of the hours of studying in one go. And I'm gonna tell you the truth. Y'all cram because it works. Cramming works, at least for the short term. If you have a bunch of exams that are not cumulative and do not have concepts that build on each other, cramming's fine, I guess. But if you need to remember that information for later, cramming is doing you a disservice. We actually know that if you do what is called a spaced practice, so you spread out your studying over a longer period of time. So instead of doing five hours of studying the night before your test, you do one hour a day over a period of five days. Space practice, you can do that. It's not really gonna make that much of a difference compared to cramming in the short term. So there's no difference between cramming or mass practice versus space practice over the short term but it's over the long term where it counts. And we know that spaced practice is always best for long term retention. So I'm not going to tell you not to cram. Dr. G would be a huge hypocrite. I've crammed, it happens. But if there's something you really, really need to remember for later, don't cram. Space out your studying. You'll probably be a lot less stressed out if you do that too. Here's another thing. Now, I know that some of you would be thrilled if I never gave you a test again or a quiz again, but I do it because again, testing works. So this is based off of research by Roddy Rodiger and Jeff Karpicki in 2006, and it's what's known as the testing effect. So what you're looking at here are, is an experiment where Rodiger and Karpicki basically um, gave people periods of studying or periods where they were tested and got feedback. So here is um, three different conditions. Four sessions of studying, so they'd study, 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 study. We have a section that is three study periods followed by a test with feedback, study, 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 test. And then we have one period of studying followed by three periods of testing along with feedback. So study, test, test, test. Here's the retention interval. So we have our short-term retention of five minutes. We have our long-term retention of one week. And again, this is one of those cases where testing doesn't really look like it works over the short term. So here, you can actually kind of see most people, the best performance over the short term are actually people who study more. So here's our study, 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 study group. Here's our study, study, study test group. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but those error bars actually overlap which means that there's no technical difference between the two groups. However, notice that the group that tests more, they're still doing pretty good. They're remembering about 70% of the material, but they're doing lower than the other two groups. That really starts to change after a longer retention interval. Look at how bad our study group is. That is not very good at all. Additionally, you'll notice that both of our groups that got testing perform much better. Now, again, here's a case where our error bars overlap, so they're not really that different from each other. But what this does tell us is that testing 
actually produces better long-term retention than if you are not tested. Because it's almost kind of deceptive, isn't it? When you're studying, you really think that you're learning a lot. And when you're tested, you really don't think that you are. But for the long term, testing yourself and quizzing yourself and me giving you tests and quizzes actually helps your memory for this information over the long term. So we talked about spacing out practice. We've talked about uh, testing yourself. Another way that we can help that we can help ourselves remember more information is by making things meaningful, especially if we make it meaningful to ourselves. So giving things meaning can help us. One of the best ways that you can remember something is by making connections with information that you already know. So we're going to talk about two major findings that can help us enhance our long-term memory. We're going to talk about Craig and Lockhart's uh, levels of processing theory. And we're going to talk about the difference between what we call elaborative rehearsal versus something known as maintenance rehearsal. The other reason that you might like this section, all of this feels very common sense in a way that I think short-term and working memory really don't. This is a lot less like theoretical. Okay, so one of the first things that we know based on Atkinson and Schifrin's, you need me to go back, Avriana? I'm sorry. This is like the memory section is my favorite section. Can you tell? I'm just like, I love memory. While I am waiting, oh, you're done? Okay, so really quick, by the way, uh, if you are interested, don't forget, you may have received an email from Dr. Teets about our career panel tomorrow. Um, you should definitely come if you have the time in your schedule. Uh, also, you can get extra credit in a course of your choosing. Um, and additionally, um, my, my good friend, Dr. Angela Abishan is going to be there. And she uh, has done work with kids with cochlear implants. So I'm really excited. And she's just a cool person. So we're also going to have people like an art therapist coming to talk. And I believe in November, we're going to bring back some Cadi alums from our psychology program. So I just got in touch with one of my advisees and she said she'd do it. I'm so excited. Okay, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about levels of processing. So you'll notice that I talked about the difference between what we call elaborative rehearsal versus maintenance rehearsal. So when we talk about maintenance rehearsal, that's us basically repeating something over and over again until it's in long-term memory. So it's just basically maintaining it. So if I'm trying to remember somebody's phone number and I have to repeat to myself, 8675309, 8675309, 8675309, 8, that's just maintenance rehearsal. However, uh, there are other ways that I could make that meaningful. So some of you that like the oldies, even though that doesn't really feel very old to me, but it is in fact an oldie, it's from the 80s. If you know anything about 80s music, you might have recognized that that phone number is from a song called Jenny that has as its chorus 8675309. Now, if you know that information, if somebody gives you that number, you can be like, oh, your number's like the number in the song. You can make that more meaningful than a basic repetitious rehearsal. 
So rehearsal is critical. Atkinson and Schifrin even noted that in their multi-store model of memory, if you wanna get information from short-term into long-term, you gotta rehearse it. And you can repeat something over and over again, but if you really need to remember it for later, making it meaningful is ultimately what's going to help you more. And this is where uh, Gus Craig and Lockhart's uh, levels of processing theory comes into play. This was developed in 1972. And it's basically the finding that if we can process information more deeply, this will lead to stronger memory traces and thus better long-term memory for that item. So the more deeply you process something, the better you will remember it. Hopefully the way that I phrase that should be kind of perking your ears a little bit. I hope you have questions. I want those critical thinking hats on. But this is the basic idea of the theory. Now, really quick, as I kind of mentioned, there is a difference between elaborative versus maintenance rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal is just simple repetition. It's repeating a string of numbers over and over again. And because it is not meaningful, it shouldn't really enhance your long-term memory because you're not making any links with anything. You're not trying to connect it to things that you already know. On the other hand, let's say you give me a, a string of numbers and I'm able to be like 2955. That is my fastest 5K time, for example. I've taken meaningless numbers and I have turned them into something that is meaningful to me and my long-term memory. This is what is called semantic processing. We're processing something based on its meaning. We are trying to make that information meaningful and we're trying to link it up with information that we already have in long-term memory. Can anybody give me an, an example of a time that they've done something like this? Can you think of an instance where you've taken new information and you've tried to tie it in with stuff that you already knew so that you'd remember it? Anybody? Hmm? Yeah, Ash. I have some psychology terms uh, in the past, especially if it's like, can't think of them right now. That's okay. But, um, I would try to relate it to my personal experiences. Okay. So I guess an example would be like if you're doing learning, like mm -hmm. thinking, currently thinking about like the times I've done this stuff. Uh huh. So that's kind of putting it into it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to remember something that's mm -hmm. personal to me. Yeah. So how many of you do something like what Ash said? Not everybody could hear. So Ash basically said that they um, try to tie information that they learn in their psychology classes to their own experiences. And I think we all do that sometimes. And one of the ways that you can actually kind of see this, like, and it's generally a helpful way to remember things, but this self-focus can be a problem when we start talking about psychological disorders. Mm -hmm. How many of you had that instance where you started learning about the disorders and you're like, oh my gosh, is that me? Like the first time I learned about schizophrenia, I because occasionally I, I would think I heard something and I didn't hear something. And I'm like, oh my gosh, does that mean I have schizophrenia? I'm like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. And I went through, for those of you that have had um, biopsych with me and you've heard me talk about all the risk factors, like I, I went through all of them. I'm like, my mother didn't have the flu. Um, I wasn't born in a winter month, like all of that stuff. So one of the ways that we try to learn is, especially in psychology, is by applying it to ourselves. And that can actually really help us. This is what's known as the self-reference effect. We do tend to find that we are all egocentric creatures. And we basically find that when we apply things to ourselves, 
we tend to have better memory for those things than when we don't. So here is um, kind of an example of the levels of processing that Crake and Tulving kind of, um, that Crake's levels of processing theory talks about. So this is something that he did with uh, Endel Tulving in 1975. So they presented people with different lists of words. And they were basically given one of three different tasks for each word. So each word, they might have had to do something different. So they would be told which one they needed to do. So in one case, this is what's called a shallow task. They basically had to decide whether the word was in upper or lower case. So in this task, they might get a word and they'd have to say, is this uppercase or lowercase? And that's called graphemic because it's based on what the word looks like. In the middle, they had a phonemic task. So in this case, they were given a word and they were asked, does this rhyme with blank? So for example, they would get the word legal and they would, ask, they would be asked if it rhymed with the word eagle which it does. Um, so that is a little bit more deep. It's more, it's a deeper form of processing in this case. So here we just have to focus on what it looks like. Here we have to focus on what it sounds like. So that's a deeper form of processing. And then finally, we have a semantic task. So they would have to figure out if the word fit within a particular sentence. So for example, she went to the store and grabbed a blank. And it could be a word like cart. And in that case, it would fit. Now, this is the deepest processing of all because we started by focusing on what the word looked like. Here in this task, we're focusing on what it sounds like. And here we're focusing on what it means, which is the deepest form of processing. And Craig and Telving actually did find that memory for items that you had to semantically process had the best performance and graphemic processing had the lowest performance. So as the processing got increasingly deeper, the better memory performance tended to be. That's especially true if the memory or if the word actually did fit in the blank. If it made sense, it was much better processed than if it didn't. And like I mentioned, other people have also found that if you ask, if you give somebody a word when you're asked whether or not it applies to your personality, people tend to remember that best of all because, well, we're egocentric. Not in a bad way. It's just you only know your own mind. You don't know anybody else's. You are your own best frame of reference. But again, that is also a form of deep processing because you have to think about what that word means and you have to think about your life and whether or not that word applies. So generally what we are going to find is that more elaboration tends to lead to better recall. And the type of the elaboration that you do ultimately matters uh, more than you think it would. So um, for example, the amount of elaboration in uh, this particular case, um, 
So if you have to fill in the blank for a simple sentence, such as she took the blank, um, that is actually going to be pretty, pretty poor. Um, additionally, uh, what we do find too is that if I give you a more complex sentence, just such as she went to go find some blank, but there was no butter to be used in the recipe. Um, so that could be something like bread. So generally, if you have to fill in a blank for a very complex sentence, such as she went to go find blank, but there was no butter to put on top of what she purchased. Um, yeah, I know it's not a great sentence, but I just thought of it on the fly. That's a complex sentence. That's going to be a little bit easier to um, for you to remember in the future because it's been more elaborated upon versus she took the blank. There's not of a lot of a, there's not a lot of elaboration there, um, and so that is going to be a bigger problem. Um, one of the other uh, one of the other examples of this is that the kind of elaboration that you do really, really matters. So, for example, um, Bransford um, back in 1979 uh, basically gave minimally elaborated sentences or maximally elaborated sentences. So for example, I believe, um, I believe that they gave, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> so here are a couple of examples. So she cooked the blank. That's a pretty simple sentence. It doesn't really, it's, it's not really gonna make you think a lot about it, but on the other hand, the bird swooped down and carried off the struggling blank. Um, elephant. <laughs> Let's make it really funny and watch a bird carry off an elephant. Um, so this has more elaboration. Craig and Tolving actually found that with this sentence, you're going to remember information from it much better. Bransfords are actually kind of funny because they're, they're doing analogies. So here's what's kind of interesting. Compare this. A mosquito is like a doctor because they both draw blood. Get it? Um, so that's a pretty good analogy and it's minimally elaborated. And because it's minimally elaborated, it actually forces you to think more about it. Compare that to something like this. Um, a mosquito is like a doctor because they both have legs, a head, uh, draw blood, are occasionally annoying. Um, <laughs> And in those cases, that is a maximally elaborated sentence. And because of that, those connections don't feel as thoughtful. And because of that, this one is actually more or memorable. So the amount of elaboration matters, but the kind matters too. This feels much more memorable than a raccoon is like a dog because they both have ears, eyes, a head, and legs. That, that makes less sense. Okay, one of the other things that we find is that distinctiveness can also actually help boost our recall. So distinctiveness is basically if, if something is processed differently from others, um, we know that that can actually be better remembered. Distinctive memories do tend to be better remembered than ones that are not. So, um, so here are some lists of words. This is actually from your textbook. And I want you to see if you notice anything kind of interesting. So I'm gonna give you a list of words. And I want you to write down as many as you can remember from each of these lists. So here's list one, chair, piano, clock, telephone, cushion, lamb, stove, mirror, radio, bookcase. Okay, so go ahead and write down as many as you can remember.
Okay. So going over that list really quick, did everybody remember the word lamb? Was that the easiest one to remember? A lot of people find that it might be, even if you didn't. And that's because all of the rest of those items were uh, furniture. And then there's one animal. And researchers find that in that case, they're gonna be more likely to remember the word lamb. Here's another list. And now that I've kind of told you this, I think I've given you a strategy. Notice the category. Um, so here's another list. Cat, dog, giraffe, mouse, cushion, lamb, monkey, beaver, turtle, tiger. Odds are pretty good cushion stands out a lot more against those animal names. And what we do tend to find is because it's more distinctive, because it stands out, uh, it tends to be better remembered. Um, additional, and, and part of the reason for this is because with a distinctive item, you're less likely to run into confusion from similar items. Um, one of the other things that we will find is that can boost your recall is how relevant information is for your later test. So something that we actually find, uh, and this is something that happens to me a lot, especially with my first year psychology students. Occasionally, and I would say that this semester doesn't count because all of my tests are open book and open note, but in years past, when my tests weren't open book and open note, um, I occasionally would get a student who would show up to class, ask really thoughtful questions, look like they were getting a good handle on the material, and then they'd take the test. And immediately they would come and meet with me. And the first words out of my mouth are always, how do you study for my tests? Because the way I see it, if you're coming to class regularly, if you look like you're getting it, if you don't have any questions, it's probably not because you don't care. It's not because you're not showing up. It's because of how you're studying. And generally what I have found for the students that show up and do the work, but aren't good at the test, when I ask them how they study, they go, I use flashcards. So here's the thing. I do occasionally test vocabulary, but a lot of my exams also include application of material. Taking what you understand about a concept and applying it in everyday life. A flashcard can help you out with vocabulary. A flashcard cannot teach you how to apply that information. So if you're studying with flashcards, you are preparing for a test that I'm not giving you. And this is what is known as transfer appropriate processing. You need to study for the type of test that you are going to get. And here's what's actually kind of interesting. So according to the levels of processing theory by Craig and Lockhart, shallow processing is always the worst thing you can do. Transfer appropriate processing actually shows that shallow processing might actually be preferred if your test is actually looking at shallow processing. So here we have uh, participants were either given a standard test or they were given a rhyming test. And depending on the task, they either had to see whether something fit a rhyme or whether something fit in a sentence. So either a rhyme task or a semantic task. And what we tend to find is that you do better on a rhyming test if you've been taught to rhyme. If you're doing semantic processing and you get a rhyming test, even though that's a deeper form of processing, it's not appropriate for the test that you have been given. And so you should always, always, always study for the type of test that you know you're going to get. Don't write this down. I want you to draw a picture for me. Um, if you are zooming in, you can, well, you can't screenshot a picture, but you can email it to me later. Um, so here's what I'd like you to think about, or you can tell me what you think is going on in the chat. How about that? So that way you don't have to draw a picture. Okay, if the balloons popped, the sound wouldn't be able to carry since everything would be too far away from the correct floor. 
A closed window would also prevent the sound from carrying since most buildings tend to be well insulated. Since the whole operation depends on a steady flow of electricity, a break in the middle of the wire would also cause problems. Of course, the fellow could shout, but the human voice is not loud enough to carry that far. An additional problem is that a string could break on the instrument. Then there would be no accompaniment to the message. It is clear that the best situation would involve less distance. Then there would be fewer potential problems. With face-to-face -face contact, the least number of things could go wrong. Do you have any idea what this vague paragraph is talking about? What do you think's going on here? Anybody? I think, uh, you know, when a tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make a noise and it falls not. Uh -huh. That's what I think of. This is a Zen Cohen? Nice. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Sounds like that. <laughs> Anybody have any ideas? Well, how about this? Do you think you would have a better understanding of what it meant if I showed you this picture? <laughs> a band. You were pretty close, Leah. So it would be something like this. So this is a case where it looks like somebody is serenading uh, another person. So we've got a microphone, a wire, uh, and then a balloon, balloons tied to a speaker. So yeah, this is based off of work. Oh, all right. This is based off of work by Bransford and Johnson. And it basically looks at the role that meaning plays in helping us frame how we interpret things. So this paragraph looks really vague and it sounds really vague. But once we can kind of organize our thoughts and that paragraph around this concept, it tends to become a little bit easier to remember. So I'm trying to see if I can find. So one of the things that we find is that meaning can really help us structure information, but predictability can, can lead us astray. So what you're looking at here is um, data, or rather experimental stimuli from research by Brewer and Trayens back in 1981. Participants are shown um, a TA's office. And this TA's office has a lot of different things. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. Do you notice anything kind of odd about this office? It's missing something. It's a teaching assistant's office. These are graduate students. What is not in this office? Books, exactly. So Brewer and Trayance basically set up this scenario where you're going into a teaching assistant's office, and then after they were shown this picture, they were asked to remember the items that they saw in there. Um, by the way, I'm hoping this is an anthropology student because um, there's a skull in here, and also this was clearly done before campuses were dry, because that's a wine bottle. So Brewer and Trayans basically presented their participants with this picture. They asked them to remember what they saw. And one of the things that they repeatedly found is that people would falsely recall that there were books present. So part of this is because of our top-down expectations and what we expect. We expect a professor's office to have a lot of books. Some of you have actually even commented when you go into my office, you're surprised there aren't many books. And that's because in my field, we don't read a lot of books. We read journal articles. Don't look in my file cabinets. Um, but people will falsely recall something that is, th that is not there um, because it fits with what we expect. This is going to have really important implications for um, this is going to have really important implications for when we talk about everyday memory, eyewitness testimony, and identification of criminals, because there are certain things that we have come to expect with criminals, and that can lead us to falsely identifying something 
that we did not actually see. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I will share some extra credit information with you on Wednesday. We will talk some more about learning, and we will also talk about why we forget. Everybody have a great day, and I will see you then.